welcome to the Wisdom Rising podcast. I'm your host, Lama Sultrama Alione. And my goal with this podcast is really to open your own wisdom, to have your own wisdom rising, either through the meditations that I lead or introduce you to, or to the people that I interview that bring wisdom with them in their own voice, in their own traditions. So we look forward to raising our wisdom together on the Wisdom Rising podcast. And I'm so happy to share this with you. Good morning, everyone, and greetings, Alyssa. Great to be with you. We met in Costa Rica just about a year ago now, and I led Alyssa in Feeding Your Demons, and she was amazed by it, asked me to teach it to others. And so we had a small group there, and then we became very close somehow immediately. And I'm so excited to have you here. And your book, The Telomere Effect, has had such an impact in the world in terms of understanding aging. And now you have stress prescription coming out. So you're a you're a scientist essentially and you teach at UCSF and research there, is that right? How you would describe yourself as a scientist? Or? Yeah. I mean I am and I like to say a contemplative scientist. I do research and I do some teaching and one of the lessons I've learned is how rather than wearing a you know, Western research hat that we want to really seek knowledge from different sources. And mm -hmm. so contemplative wisdom and contemplative science have been such gifts that have changed my life and made research so much more meaningful to really be studying, well, interventions, for example, different meditation interventions and trying to understand the mind through the lens of experience rather than just what we can measure. And as you know, Lama, I'm so excited about Feed Your Demons from a research perspective because you have crystallized and manualized a, an experience we can have that is so powerful, changing our embodied emotional state. Mm. And the way you've done it with this, the visual is that if anyone listening has not been led through Feed Your Demons, I mm. know opportunities on the Tara Mandala website. There it is. <laughs> and the power of using the mind. Well, the the problem that, that we're addressing we all have, which is we we carry trauma, we carry problems that stress us out, even when we're not aware of it. We're not aware of it often because we push it away. It's threatening and we don't want to be it's it's very easy to to try to live with it by distraction and and repression and suppression and those those work for very short times they don't work for a lifetime right they so the ability to visualize and work with emotion and transform it to a constructive force mm -hmm. you with the de from the demon to the ally is absolutely brilliant i can't wait to study it in the book i talk about other ways to transform emotions they're a bit less concrete. But one of them is using the power of our beliefs. When we feel all of this threat stress, it feels absolutely horrible. We all know what it feels like to feel like we're in a situation that we're going to have, you know, tremendous loss, humiliation, embarrassment, that something we care about deeply is at risk. And so we have this threat response and we need that for short periods to cope. But the problem is that we we tend to carry that around often and that causes more toxic chronic stress on the body. And so when we're in the midst of feeling that threat stress, one thing that we can do is use our ground into beliefs about power, efficacy, resources, support. You know, I list a lot of options and our beliefs can shift and change the stress response. 
but it's work and effort. We need it. It's like a mantra. We need to have it ready. We need to recite it and let ourselves believe it. And then in the moment, it can actually change the stress response. And so that's a kind of on, you know, on call in the moment or just in time intervention. Feeding your demons is so different because you could do it once and you could feel a sense of release and peace about the major issue in your life. And I did it, it as you know, that happened for me. And I, it's exciting. It's using our amazing mind body in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And someone in the chat asked if you had done a study of feeding with demons and she hasn't yet, but uh, we hope to do that in the future. And there has been one that's about to be published by Dr. Eve Ekman and Philippe Golden. And this is a study that was done now a couple of years ago, but it's just getting published now. And it's, it shows very promising results in terms of how feeding your demons works and that it does work for anxiety, depression, and addiction. Those are the three things that were studied. And so that's going to be really exciting when that study comes out. So this is something that maybe you can talk about because you're kind of in this edge of research versus experience and how getting these studies done has impacted the ability to use things like meditation in settings that maybe before it it wouldn't have been accepted in. But then there's a study and all of a sudden it's acceptable and you're really working in that in that world. So I'd love to hear what you've seen and, you know, maybe the last 10 years in terms of that shift. And I'd also like to hear kind of tagged on to that, but slightly different question. How does this book relate to the telomere effect? Is it, is it a natural sort of development? And if so, how do those work together? Two big, great, juicy questions. I'll take the second one first, which is easier. The telomere effect that I wrote with Nobel laureate Elizabeth Blackburn was a, a big book summarizing 15 years of research on understanding how we control our own aging, the ways that we can speed up or slow down our aging. And we particularly focus on telomeres. They're a window into our aging process. They're caps at the ends of our chromosomes that are very sensitive to the biochemical conditions. When it gets too stressful, when psychological stress, physiological stress, the telomeres shut down the cell, it dies, or it becomes too old and can't replicate because we don't want cancer. We don't want bad things to happen with too much free radicals. We can get DNA mutations and, and other problems. So the telomeres, in a way, protect us from cancer and from too much stress damaging the cell by killing the cell or inactivating it. Telomeres get shorter with age, and when they're too short, the cell can't replenish and keep dividing. And so it's a they're really important to protect. We want to keep them long and stable during our life. And so we review a lot of the lifestyle things like an anti-inflammatory or antioxidant stress diet that is good for telomeres. But the big story there, in my view, is that living with stress every day and not not managing it, not realizing that it's a dominant force in our day and it's shaping all of our health behaviors is really related to telomere shortening, trauma, chronic stress. And part of that is that it's shaping both our biochemistry to be more toward aging but it's also sacking our health behaviors, exercise, poor diet, poor sleep. So it's it's the one thing, if we were to choose one New Year's resolution, our emotional well-being shapes everything. And so just adding something to your day, like a mini meditation, or there are other other ways to nudge nudge stress to be a a weaker force or non-dominate force and really focus on amplifying joy and ease. So after we wrote The Telomere Effect, what spoke to people the most, we already know about what's good for our lifestyle, but what spoke to them most was really realizing that we can transform our stress response. And that was only one chapter in the book. And I provide that chapter for free on my website, alyssaepple.com. But 
there's so much more we can do besides just trying to move from a threat to a challenge response once we're already stressed. And we can talk about what some of the strategies are, but the book, instead of being a big, long science book, it's a really small practical book. And it just goes through, you know, try one thing a day for seven days. Of course, it could take seven weeks or seven months. It doesn't matter. But if you even just adopt one habit, it can help us manage stress and really transform it into an ally. That's kind of the idea behind it. Uh-huh. Yeah, so, right. It's very practical. Yeah. So it's kind of a fold out from the cell aging book of, you know, and <laughs> here are all these things that science have shown. And so many of them are informed by Buddhist wisdom. Mm-hmm. The whole idea of the big idea, the worldview, the mindset of understanding that we don't control outcomes. We control conditions, or we can try to call, control conditions, but not what really ends up happening. We don't control the externals in our life very much at all. And just realizing that we can do our best and and not be attached to outcomes is a relief. It's stress reducing. And so this focus on even uncertainty at realizing the future is always 100% uncertain and it always has been. And now we all use that word so much because of the pandemic, we see the uncertainty. That alone is a mindset shift of, honey, I can relax around uncertainty. And I'm mm-hmm. measuring it in my research because it's so important. And people who can flex, who can tolerate uncertainty, who don't tense up if they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, they have much less anxiety, PTSD, depression from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's helpful. So really, it seems like what you did was take that chapter in the telomere effect and then expand on it and create practical solutions or suggestions for people to implement things that would actually strengthen those little guys on the end of our DNA. (laughs) Related to telomeres. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So what about that other question that I asked you about what you've seen happen with these studies that have come up, I think, starting with the mindfulness, uh, stress reduction, and so on. And how has it made it possible to be in an academic environment and include these kinds of things. It used to be like, you can talk about that in academia, right? Right. (laughs) Yes, it's a really great point how important research is. It is, it's been my North Star science and it has been helpful to bring in practices and show their effectiveness in medical settings in cost savings, in things that the business world cares about, productivity, those have been the vectors, the pathways that we have brought mindfulness to be mainstream, showing the neuroscience, showing how it can change brain responses to stress or thickening of the neocortex. So those have been very exciting. I feel like we're beyond those. And now we need to go into showing how we can disseminate them in systems because we have so much knowledge about how much they work. Let me give you some examples. We now know that mindfulness-based meditation programs like MBSR can be as effective as drugs for anxiety, Lexapro, new study by Elizabeth Hoji. We know that it can help with blood pressure control. We know that with uh, an amped up therapy for using mindfulness, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy can be just as effective as antidepressants or more. So we don't have the side effects. So why don't we use this knowledge? For me, I'm always looking at the body and I want to say, I want to see what's it doing that we can't do with drugs. And my the best example of this is inflammation. We really want to keep our inflammation low as we age because it can creep up. We call that inflammation aging, especially with depression and chronic stress. We don't have a drug to control inflammation 
in our bodies. We certainly don't. Nothing that's not risky and with with side effects that make it so that we're not taking a you know we're not all taking anti-inflammatory drugs because we don't have one that's safe. But we do have a method that's safe, and it is mind body interventions, mind body practices, meditation, yoga, qigong. These have been shown over and over in meta analyses to reduce inflammation, to reduce the gene expression for all the inflammatory related genes. That's amazing to me. Why are we using that more? <laughs> yeah. And I think that you have also in, in this upcoming book, the relationship with nature as a stress reductor. Can you talk about that a little bit? I'm certainly aware of it in myself. And forest bathing has become a kind of uh, thing recently. But I'm interested in the research around that, what, what has been found. That was my absolute funnest chapter to write. And <laughs> just the amount of research showing the green effect, showing urban greenery or wild nature immersion is affecting our thoughts, our anxiety, perceived stress, and our attention span, our ability to solve problems, how we do on cognitive tasks, and of course, our stress regulation system. So blood pressure goes down. And, and like you said, it's been medicalized. So like in New Zealand, they write green prescriptions. You know, if you have high blood pressure, go out in nature three times a week, 45 minutes, and just walk slowly. And that can reduce your blood pressure. Wow. So, you know, it's been, and of course, that is a way to get it to be commonly used. And the the rural urban effect is huge. So like birds and honeybees that live in the city versus the country are so much more stressed out. They have shorter telomeres, more oxidative stress. And us too, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not um, rocket science to understand that our minds are taxed. We are more vigilant when we're being bombarded by city noise, city mm -hmm. stimuli versus being in nature. And the nature effect is, is it, it feels a bit magical. There's all there's so many parts to it. There's awe and wonder and how that can really shrink our big ruminative mind to be understanding we're just a tiny piece of being connected to this huge, vast, expansive world. That's so wonderful. It it puts into, I guess, science, the experience that I have here where I live near the beach and I have this need to go to the beach every day. And it really feels like a physical need, like I need to go. And as soon as I get there, I think there's something that happens where uh, I've heard that where the ocean hits the, the shore, there's negative ions or something like that that uh, are released. But I do feel, I feel that shift and it does feel like a need. Of course, living in Taramandala, you're living in that, in nature, which I did for 25 years. But here I live, you know, in, in the city, so to speak, but then the beach is there. So do you know anything specifically about the beach or about the ocean and that effect? What you describe has been shown with research. There are more ions in in a forest, for example, especially if there's a waterfall, especially if there's been fresh rainfall. And so the beach, yes, the same. So there, the air is different and those sounds, the rhythmic sounds, there are the odors that we're probably evolutionarily tied to think of as safety and ease. And, and it's interesting to me, Lama, that you, I know you have a, a very dedicated ritualized daily practice. Mm -hmm. And yet you still need nature. And you're just good for all of us to hear, you know, it's a valid need. We we should be less nature deprived and really having that as part of our routine. Mm -hmm. And I don't as far as long as I've known you, you have always chosen if we do any activity, you're taking me to blooms in the botanical gardens or the beach to see turtles or it's always nature. Yeah, that's true. I, you know, when I traveled and for example, in 2018, I did a book tour and I took 45 different flights and 
what just bubbled up for me to do was to find water and sit with water and do this practice called integration with water, where you just look at it. And I found oceans, I found lakes, I found streams. Like I, I could pretty much always find water. And then you look at it and then you dissolve the boundary between yourself and the water. So there's no journey to the water. The water's not journeying to you. It's a complete field. And you rest in that. You integrate with it. There's a Tibetan word called jor, which means to, to join with. So I would do that. And I would just put my phone on 10 minutes or 15 or 20 or whatever I had. So I could let go of like, should I end this now? Or should I keep going? I'm going to do 10 minutes. And whoever I was with, you know, my assistants or people who were hosting me, we would do it together. And it was like a, a thread that in all that travel and all those cities and so on, it brought me home again because nature is home. Mm -hmm. And we've lost our home, so many of us. I mean, I live in the city. It is home. It has such a powerful effect just be partly because it's coming at all of our sensory gates and our bodies responding to it. And so as long as we don't get in our way, holding on to rumination, et cetera, we can really let it dissolve stress for us. Mm -hmm. I like what Bodhi said, Juan just wrote, find yeah. water, sit with water, dissolve and rest. Yeah, that's a really simple way of explaining what I just talked about integration. A lot of the people listening today are in cities, but luckily most cities do have parks and some have really big, amazing parks and some are smaller, but even just being able to go somewhere where there's some trees and, and try integrating with a tree. One, one of the things that has been exciting to me in the last year is to discover that the first Buddhist goddesses were tree spirits called yakshinis. Those are the first. That was before Tara, before Prajnaparamita. The earliest reference to goddesses in Buddhism is trees. And the Bodhi tree that the Buddha was enlightened under, some scholars feel this was actually a yakshini shrine. And so to find a tree and to connect to the spirit of the tree could be just a little tree on the road. You know, it doesn't matter. But when you jor, you join with that tree, there's something that happens inside. And so I think even if, if people are in cities and far from oceans or maybe not near any body of water that they could meditate with, there's always something that you can find that would bring you home in that way. And if not, you know, you, you can have a house plant. <laughs> Those also bring a lot into, into your home. So this is wonderful, Alyssa. And I love how practical this new book is. And I think it's a great combination, uh, the telomere effect, which was a New York Times bestseller and really has had an impact in the world. And then this one of sort of like, okay, now let's take that piece of like, how do we do this out? And here's some very practical ways you can do it. And I'm so excited. It's, it's coming out the 27th of December. So I imagine in terms of all your stresses and so on, it's all getting ready for the book launch. Um, and we can also pre-order it already. I looked at Amazon and saw that you could. So that's exciting too. And you're actually right now reading it for Audible, right? So yes, it, I, I am. Thank you. Thank you for your support. It's it's fun to read because I've been trying to practice what I preach and be present for the words and feel things. Yes. And, so, and and that's how I feel when I'm with you, Lama. You are feeling things and sharing them so that when I haven't noticed the yakshinis and dakinis, but when you point them out and you're touching leaves and you're hugging trees 
it just opens up the, or it gets rid of the barriers so that for me and people around you, I have seen them, I have felt them. I have had my own sensory gates opened and we can do that for each other. I, you know, I just love being with you and you do that for me and I'm so grateful. Yeah, and and thank you so much for today. I'm in gratitude right now for you and for our friendship and deep connection. And thank you. Lots of love, everyone. And thank you, Alyssa. Thank you so much. Such an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being with us for this Wisdom Rising podcast. May it benefit all beings. And I'd like to take a moment to thank the production team of Wisdom Rising, and also to let you know that if you would like further information on my work or the associated people who work with Tara Mandala, you can reach out to the Tara Mandala website, T-A-R-A-M-A-N-D-A-L-A dot O-R-G. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe.